Hey R fam, I am your host Sashant and welcome back to the channel. It's so great to have you here because it's Oscar season. The Oscars are the best time of the year. People are watching movies, talking about movies, and most of all, they're celebrating the movies. And in that spirit, I want to talk about this year's 10 Best Picture nominees, give you a brief rundown on each of them, what they're about, you know, some of my thoughts, and hopefully you could find some of these films if you haven't had the opportunity of seeing them yet because they're all great films, but if you haven't had the opportunity, you'd hopefully be enticed to watch a couple before the ceremony this Sunday. So, let's get into it. No more wasting time. There's 10 Best Picture nominees. And of course, uh, before we continue, let's also note that it's ultimately all subjective, that uh, whatever gets nominated and wins, there's a subjective element to it. Um, there's some incredible films that did not make the Best Picture 10 this year, but you know, that being said, this is the list that the Academy has, so that's what we're gonna uh, pay attention to. Now, let's start alphabetically. Let's start with American Fiction. American Fiction, uh, starring Jeffrey Wright, uh, written and directed by Cord Jefferson, wildly his directorial debut, by the way. And uh, it's based off a book called Erasure that I've heard incredible things about, too. Uh, essentially, the film is about a black professor in the United States who's also an author, and he gets suspended from his job due to a disagreement with a student, and um, then has to spend some time kind of writing. And the whole film in internally seems to have this debate about what it means to be a black author. And it, it often talks about uh, how black authors have to play into a white reader's sensibilities and how that plays into, you know, executives, but also influences what black authors themselves are willing to share and say. And the flip side to that is that those kinds of stories, while they might be more palatable to a broad audience, are still honest experiences and stories. And it's, it's Jeffrey Wright's character who's ultimately caught between these two schools of thought. And, and, it's really interestingly presented. I, I, I think in terms visually, it's it's very simple. There's you know maybe one dreamlike or two dreamlike sequences that happen throughout the course of the film, but it doesn't use any over the top camera trickery to get you there. I think it's it has a very grounded approach to it, which sort of allows the debate and the dialogue to flow really well. That being said. It's really funny. It is shockingly funny and interesting, and there were moments I found myself gasping to. It's a really well-written film. It's kind of a shoe in for Best Adapted Screenplay this year. And I would say if you're a writer or if you're intrigued by some of our more, um, you know, political discussions about uh, art, I think I think it's a very interesting film because there's there aren't necess there isn't necessarily a right answer that you come out with. Which brings me to the next film. If you've seen Anatomy of a Fall, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anatomy of a Fall is a French film. In fact, there are two films this year that are foreign language films that are nominated, the other being The Zone of Interest. But Anatomy of a Fall is masterfully uh, directed by Justin Tri Justine Trier. Uh, she's phenomenal at telling what is, again, a simple story, but does so with... This is the perfectly made version of what this concept in movie is. Essentially, um, the the lead played by Sandra Huller, um, her uh, she plays a character named Sandra. Yep, I was like actually looking up her name right now. Sandra plays Sandra. Anyway, so Sandra's husband um, mysteriously dies while she is home. He's doing some carpentry and. It seems apparent that he's fallen out of his window somehow. The audience doesn't really know how, and there are brief bits of, um, you know, information and uh, essentially evidence presented as to whether this was an accident or something premeditated. And that's all we really know going into it in the first 10 minutes. And then you're taken on this wild legal ride uh, of this court case that plays out that is so awfully detailed and and yet takes you into the complexity of a marriage and it's it's really interesting and it's a very dialogue heavy film for sure but that being said it is it is so perfectly paced to the point that i was gripped through and through it is it is another really solid pick and probably going to win best original screenplay and an incredible lead performance so definitely worth checking out if you're into if you're into the, the the little details of the law, this is this is something that you're definitely going to enjoy. Um, let's move on to Barbie. Barbie is um, the highest grossing film of last year. You've probably already seen it, but if you haven't, as you know, Greta Gerwig, phenomenal director, um, whether it's Little Women, Lady Bird, and Barbie. I mean, 
she is kind of a powerhouse in terms of her style and her energy and what she brings itself. And additionally, let's not discount the incredible cast, uh, Margot Robbie, America Ferrera, Ryan Gosling. Um, there was a bit of controversy about this film, not getting some of the nominations, whether it's for Best Director or Best Actress, but you know some of the performers have gotten nominated, the screenplay's nominated, the movie itself, of course, is nominated. And this is probably gonna take home some uh, you know technical awards, be it song or production and costumes. We'll get more into the specifics of that in our um, predictions video. But Barbie is a film that takes the history of this doll and and you know the the ever so uh, the eponymous uh, ever so um you know widely recognized barbie doll and it sort of in a very self-aware manner tells the story of what these dolls mean and represent to women what it's like to be a woman in society and at the same time it does so in this incredibly visually stunning fashion you are taken into the barbie world and and it is a gorgeous world to invest yourself in you of course have the contrasting real world too that uh, you know a lot of this film takes place in but there's a certain energy and tone to the film wherein the dialogue is very fantastical and over the top and yet it sort of speaks to you in um, a very natural real way about ever-present things in society today some people including myself definitely do feel that some of its messaging gets a little bit uh, direct um, or heavy-handed towards the end of the film especially which almost could take away from what you're hoping to get from this film but that being said there is so much to love about Barbie if you're there for just an energetic fun experience I think amongst the 10 nominees this is certainly the most fun of the movies and definitely probably the most energizing um, yeah it probably is and it is certainly certainly you know it's made a lot of money for a reason and I would say, hey, you know, if you, I, I think this is the film that I could recommend to almost anyone. If, if you want to just watch a movie, watch Barbie. Uh, moving on to The Holdovers, directed by Alexander Payne, who's made films such as The Descendants, which of course was, you know, an Academy darling. He made a film uh, like Sideways, which was very well recognized about Schmidt. And um, he's kind of known for a somewhat stripped down, tame, uh, naturalistic, dialogue-driven story that isn't, necessar isn't necessarily like rushing to a conclusion or to a point, but is definitely more, for the most part, about the energy of the film and the characters and what they're experiencing. And this film in particular is, is about a uh, curmudgeonly professor, beautifully played by Paul Giamatti. In fact, the role was written for him. And he teaches at a boarding school and there are some kids who don't go home for the holidays and he has been assigned to stay at the school during Christmas bake as well. And essentially it's just about their interactions, almost in terms of the plot. It sounds like it's the barest of them all, but I kid you not when I say that emotionally it's probably the most riveting experience I've had um, in, in months. It is, it is a really, really well-told uh, story of exploring this character who just, you know, feels like he's figured everything out and he's an adult, but he's obviously so jaded by the world and his past life that it's it's a coming of age for this old man to some extent. And uh, it is it is amazing. I want to give a shout out to Dominic Sessa, who plays one of his students, who is absolutely incredible in the film. And of course, Divine Joy Randolph, who is gunning for the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. My gosh. Um, the film, I think I expected the least off of the 10 that easily blew me away. Um, definitely, definitely worth checking out. If you just want to have a good Christmas time, I think this is it. Have a good Christmas time. Coming in next, my gosh, Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm going to say this off the bat. I love this film, but I don't know if I can watch it again. There's a few experiences that get me like that. It's got nothing to do with the length. It's got nothing to do with the quality. It's the fact that it is so heart-wrenching and just gut-twisting and god it, it it tears me up inside to think about this film and, and ultimately the film did its job it is essentially about the osage community in um i believe it was the early 20th century uh yeah it was like the 1919 um i think and um they discover oil uh within their community and and uh beneath their land and 
of course, as you would expect, you then have people from outside the community, primarily white Americans, coming in to harvest that oil. And, you know, the way that plays in to some of the sinister nature of the characters, whether it's Leonardo DiCaprio or Robert De Niro in terms of, you know, their ultimate capitalist objective, how that so viciously plays into their personal interactions with the people of the Osage community is 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 it horrifying to witness it's somehow made so entertaining to witness and it it really takes you on a ride that is deep into the the heredity of the potential of humanity but somehow it is it is also told as a thriller it it's you know there's there's kind of like this mystery where you know the answer, but the point is that you know the answer in terms of what's going on. And you're kind of just eerily, uncomfortably, stupidly engaged with this amazing experience. It is shockingly just horrifying in, in the most entertaining way possible. Martin Scorsese is incredible at doing that. And it somehow sustains this high energy for three hours straight. It, plus, it is, it is a shocking historical tale i've said the word shocking and horrifying many times but it is but yet it also keeps you in the room with leonardo dicaprio and the phenomenal lily gladstone of them just simply living what is a seemingly normal life to anyone else in the community but deep down is entrenched in such uh pain and uh colonialism that is very much um you know uh colonialism that is this is very much common throughout our history and the history of the United States. So so it, it really is just I got it. you got to watch it. It's it's the one I think of the 10 that I can't describe in words simply because of how riveting and amazing and complex the film is. And Lily Gladstone incredible performance. Uh not sure it, it was disappointing that this one did not get nominated for best adapted screenplay and I can't fully guarantee it's going to win any awards, but Lily Gladstone is in the top two. It's a two-horse race for Best Actress, and if she gets it, hey, rightly so. Rightly deserved. Coming up next, we have Bradley Cooper's Maestro. It's directed by Bradley Cooper, starring Bradley Cooper as well. It's about a uh, famous American composer named Leonard Bernstein, and, um, you know, from his life in, like, the early to mid-19th century primarily. Uh, and Bradley Cooper, first off, stunning performance. And... Uh, Carrie Mulligan as well, the lead actress, stunning performance. It's kind of about a couple of things. Bradley Cooper's devotion to his work and his understanding of himself and, and sort of what it means to be a complex being in the mind of an artist, uh, but also his relationship uh, with Carrie Mulligan's Felicia. It's, it's an interesting tale because I think what I love most about Maestro is what it does visually. There's Bradley Cooper makes the good choice of, of just locking off the camera and letting people exist. And that sort of plays into a lot of what he hopes to put out there is this feeling of existence. And so when you have the film reaching these energetic highs, it really, really gets to you in, in this wildly unexpected way. And then, you know, when it's tame, it really is, you know, taking its time uh, to, you know, put its message across. I, I think of the films here, I, I would say that I do love everything technical about it. I, I think it w I can see that it may be hard for some people to fully grasp the entirety of the point of the film, uh, but but I think there is plenty to be taken away nonetheless. And uh, if you're a fan of Bradley Cooper and you want to see an amazing Bradley Cooper performance, nothing like it. This is a this is a film driven by one of the best performances of the year. Um, a film. Now, the next one, uh, my personal favorite on the list that not only has one of the best performances of the year, it's my favorite film of last year. It's probably going to win, and it is just, woo! I've seen it like four times. I can't stop thinking about it and watching this movie. It's Oppenheimer. Listen, we all know Christopher Nolan's genius. We all know every actor in this movie is amazing. We all know the Barbenheimer phenomenon. We know all of this happened, but this film... It's just, 
Wow. I mean, still, to this day, the idea in its construction, the way the story is told, it's about J. Robert Oppenheimer, the uh, father of the nuclear bomb, essentially, primarily, it goes through a lot of his life, but it mainly focuses on his time surrounding World War II and, um, you know, the Manhattan Project, which was the development and then rather the first development of nuclear weapons in our world. Um, the film really takes you on this ride that is so... Um, you know, it's so fast paced and intense and it's dense and it has so much meaning to our present day. And it's visually the most inventive, especially when you get to see the the, the quantum world. Uh, you know, it's, it's so unique in its presentation. And as you'd expect, Christopher Nolan does not care to, to be straightforward, but, but I think that's not without purpose. That's not without the idea that you are emotionally engaged through and through and taken on an arc and a journey of this very complicated protagonist who's had such a massive impact on our world, but ultimately also led to one of the most devastating things on our planet. It is wild to root for someone who gave humanity the power to destroy itself, essentially, as they say in the film. It's, it's a really, really interesting tale. Um, and I'm not doing it justice. I am not doing it justice whatsoever by telling you that it is... I mean, it's going to be regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. It already is, but I think when you look at best picture winners in history, it's going to be up there amongst like one of the best, one of the most deserving. Everything from the music to film editing, it's going to win. I think Robert Downey Jr. and Killian Murphy are probably going to win. I think it's going to win best director. It's going to win best picture. It is, it is a stunning. It's an achievement at filmmaking, and and you could say that for any of these ten films, but I'm going to say it from Oppenheimer. It is an achievement in filmmaking. It's unbelievably good if you get the chance to see it in the theater you should especially in IMAX but I'm sure you oh wow I just I, I don't know it's it's fantastic um moving on we have a much smaller much simpler but equally devastating film called Past Lives. Past Lives is directed by Celine Song and um it covers uh the the journey of this character who essentially it's it's part uh, firstly, the film is part Korean, part English, but it also covers um, the journey of our lead, played by Greta Lee, wonderfully played by uh, Greta Lee, who, um, you know, grew up in South Korea, moved to the United States. When she was in South Korea, she had like a little childhood sweetheart, and after she moves to the, to the United States, that person sort of comes back into her life. That's really it. That's really not a ton going on. There's not much more I want to say either. But this film does two incredible things. First off, it makes you, it has so much to say about what love is in the context of our life, how life essentially is the amalgamation of all of our experiences and how we are individuals in the face and very complex individuals in the face of a complex life and, and love makes that no less complex. But um, additionally, what I loved about this movie is it, finds a way to make every interaction that any two characters have feel so real. You feel so present, whether it's two people on S Skype, because it's kind of like a, there's a bit of a timeline to this film. So whether it's two people on Skype um, talking and the internet's bad, or whether it's two, you know, a boyfriend and a girlfriend in a room having an, not uncomfortable, but an awkward conversation, it is so perfect the, the actors are so perfectly directed that there you feel every bit of this if you want to feel one romance and really think about the grand scheme of love and what it means to you and at the same time have a literally watch people just exist on screen this is probably the way to do it um there's another film where you can definitely feel existence that i'll, that I'll get into in a minute um but yeah past lives is phenomenal um really really uh, so, it does the strangest balance of simple uh, but stupidly hard-hitting. It is the simplest film in its construction and presentation, but it finds a way through its simplicity to make it feel as grounded and real, and it it hit. It, it hits really good. Um, a film that I'm... The next one that is not simple. The, uh, Poor Things is not a simple movie. Poor Things is, in fact, the opposite of a simple movie. It is over-the-top, weird, 
absolute insanity. It is Emma Stone in, an, in a genius performance, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, who's made films um, like The Killing of a Sacred Deer, The Lobster, uh, The Favorite, which you know received a lot of Oscar buzz a few years ago. And so if you've seen any of those films, you know that he is not interested in making a film that isn't quote-unquote weird. He has this sensibility that allows strangeness to feel so inviting and funny and interesting and almost allows, uh, you know, strangeness to be... I think that's the only word I can use to describe this is it's strange, but it, it, he uses strange to help you understand the real and the unstrange. And he does it in this in this film that, I mean, I'm gonna tell you what it's about and you're gonna be like, what? It is, it's based in Victorian London. Uh, it, it has some, in terms of how it's filmed, it has some cyberpunk feel to it. Um, it's about Emma Stone, who, uh, who essentially is resurrected by a monster played by Willem Dafoe and the way Emma Stone is resurrected is uh, because Emma Stone's corporeal body, her, her physical body, she she dies literally in the first seconds of the film. Um, and um, did I say cyberpunk? Steampunk, sorry. Um, I was thinking about that. Anyway, um, so she literally dies. And in order to resurrect her, uh, Willem Dafoe uh, inserts the brain of a newborn baby into her head. And so you have the existence of this adult physical being with the brain and the sensibilities of a newborn baby. And the interplay that that holds says so much about our experience of being human, about how an ego develops as you are an adult. And, and it does so in the funniest way that it made me reflect on my own ego and my own self and, and just... Uh, made me laugh at my own understanding of this odd experience of being human. It is, um, it's a, it's a trip. It is wild. Uh, it's also a very, it's a film that in addition to exploring what it means to be human, explores a lot about a human sexual experience. Um, but it does so in a way that like, while there sure is a lot of sex on screen, it does so in both an intriguing and uh, gripping way in terms of what the character's experiencing, but also in a really funny way too. This film is a visual treat. There, the, the production design, the costumes, the cinematography, all of it. Some of the shot choices, these fisheye lenses are just perfectly, perfectly chosen. It, it is such, it is, it is hilarious. It's, while I said Barbie was the most fun of the, the, the 10 movies, Poor Things is the most funny of the 10 movies. Um, it's, it's wild. It is, it is something that I just, I have no other words for. Maybe, you know, give it a shot. Give it a shot because it's, it's just so weird, but it's weird in the best way possible. In the best way possible. And finally, we have The Zone of Interest. The Zone of Interest is a German film directed by Jonathan Glazer. Um, essentially... It's about a uh, commandant of uh, the, the Auschwitz concentration camps from World War II and how he and his family live um, in their house pretty much next to the concentration camps. Um, and it is a eerie movie. It is very much like something that creeps on you as, as it goes. It's very simple and tame in terms of, you know, the development of the plot. It's ultimately just about people living their day-to-day -day lives for the most part. Um, but it's done with this grand juxtaposition that is presented in a very specific way. Essentially, a lot of the conceit of the movie is um, these people living their normal lives, but the sounds of war and the sounds, the, the barbaric sounds of the concentration camp essentially being the soundtrack to their lives. It It is this incredible contrast that ultimately gives you insight into just the, the the horrifying nature and the banality of what we, you know, um, of, of humanity in terms of how we look at other human beings in war, but also just how these two things coexist at the same time. And, and not that they have to, but people sort of choose them to. Uh, there's a certain complicity to the nature that we have when it comes to war. And, um, 
you know, it's it, it's very well presented here conceptually. I, I will say, if you're looking for more of a, of a, well, to call this a vibe movie would make it seem like it's a fun vibe. But if you're looking for a movie with a specific energy versus like, you know, a ton of like, oh, what's happening next? What's happening next? Uh, you know, if it's a very specific energy. And, and I think that's what the film uh, does best. So if you're into that kind of film, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, it's it's fantastic. As somehow, some way, it's it's simple and bad. I think with a lot of the 10 films, I, I've said that they're simple but great. And, and I think you kind of put these into two buckets for the most part. There's films that are over the top amazing visually and do a lot of uh, technical things that are super hard to achieve, whether it's like Poor Things, Oppenheimer, Barbie. Um, then you have the very simple movies like um, American Fiction, Past Lives, The Zone of Interest. But there are some films with a happy medium. I'd say Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Anatomy of a Fall. Um, and I put the holdovers on the simpler side too, actually. Um, it's a wide array of 10 movies this year um, that, that I think sort of spans across not just some of the best filmmaking of the year, but some of the best filmmaking in the last many years. And it definitely, you know, if you ever get the chance to watch all 10, you're going to be in for a ride. You're going to pick your favorites. I told you, Oppenheimer, I picked my favorite. Um, but that being said, it is, it has been a good year for movies. You know, thank you for sitting through this and watching, you know, and watching me talk about the movies. I, I'm really excited for the Oscars. Are you, and more importantly, who are you rooting for? Who's going to win? Uh, is it Oppenheimer? Yes. And tell me why. Um, but thank you so much for watching. Please comment below some of your thoughts about any of these movies and your predictions for the Oscars. We do have a predictions video on the channel up as well. And um, my social media is, is down below, the whole thing. Hit me up. Tell me what you're thinking. And I'll see you next time.